perfunctory or quick perusal of this week's parasha might, might bore you at the different, different materials and measurements and just basically a, a, uh, it's, a uh, it's the plans. It's the plans for a structure. We know it's a very holy structure, but a superficial reading of the parsha might, might not excite you too much. But beneath, beneath the layers are hidden treasures that we could all learn from. The, at the beginning of the parsha, the Torah states, the Torah states the different materials that were needed for the construction of the tabernacle. And the Torah goes on to say that there was gold, silver, copper, different types of wools, different types of materials, um, different types of woods, oils, and the Torah finishes off by saying that certain types of precious stones were required. Avne shoam v'avne miluim lo efod v'lachoshen for different vestments of the of the kohanim and for the kohen gadol for the high priest. So, analyzing this list, the commentaries point out that it's listed in in descending order, in order of importance. It starts off with gold, which is obviously the most precious, silver, copper, and then the wood, different types of wood and oils that are lesser, of lesser value. However, when we finish the list, we come across these precious stones, which seemingly are, were a very rare commodity, being that they were, these were the stones that were used for the vestments of the Kohen Gadol. It was even more rare than gold and silver. So if it's going in descending order, why, is, why are those stones listed last? So one of the great commentaries, the Or Chaim HaKadosh, who lived about 500 years ago or so, he explains, he gives a number of answers, several answers, but I'll share with you two of the answers tonight. One of the answers he gives is that the benefactors of these precious stones were the Nisim. The Nisim were the leaders of each individual tribe had a Nasi. Nowadays, a Nasi in modern Hebrew means president is called a Nasi, but a Nasi meant the leader. Each individual tribe had a leader, had a Nasi. And the Nasi of each tribe brought these stones um, as their gift towards the fundraising campaign of the, of the tabernacle. Now, for reasons that are a separate discussion we're not going to get into tonight, they donated their stones, their, their present and their, their uh, donation that they gave was, gave was given last. That was the last, they were the last benefactors, they were the last present givers of the fundraising campaign of the Mishkan. For that reason, the Orachayim explains, that's why, it's, that's why it's mentioned last. If you give last, you're going to be mentioned last. So even though it was very precious what they gave, what they donated, what they sponsored for this tremendous, tremendous um, cause, but because they left it until the end, until everyone was finished giving already, so God, God repays measure for measure. In a way, it was a little bit of a, of a mistake that they made on their part. And they were mentioned, their, their sponsorship is men mentioned last. However, he gives another, another <coughs> deeper answer, which is a lesson, I think, for all of us here. He says that how do they get these stones? Where do these stones come from? These precious stones, did they just find them? Did they, did they, have, a, uh, did they have a business? Were they, were they diamond dealers? Where did they get these precious stones from? So he, he brings from a Gemara, that the Gemara states, the Talmud states, that these precious stones actually fell from heaven. They fell from heaven and directly right in front of their door. And it was literally heaven sent, like the man. It just dropped from Shemayim, it dropped from the heavens. And as such, there was no... There was no effort involved in their, in their donating, sponsoring these precious stones. It just fell to them. And when it came time to, for them to sponsor these, these stones for the, for the priestly vestments, they, they just brought them. They simply took them and they brought them to the, to, uh, to the fundraising campaign headquarters. That was it. There was no blood, sweat, and tears as opposed to the other materials and gold and silver and materials that were required, which literally came with blood, sweat, and tears and effort on behalf of, of, the, of the Jewish people, this was, not, this was not so. The stones that they brought were heaven sent without effort, without having to sweat much and do much for them. Being, being, being so, so that because of that reason, they are mentioned last, because the materials listed in this list are listed in order of, uh, in order of the effort that was put in um, on behalf of the Jewish people. Since they did not work very hard in, in bringing their, their sponsorship, their donation, so it's listed last. 
commensurate to the effort put in to the sponsorship, to the donation given, that's the importance that it's given in the list in the Torah. That's why it's mentioned last. From this Arachayim, we see an unbelievable thing. We see that God does not, doesn't demand of us to give great, great, great amounts, great, great um, sums. What God wants from us is, a, is a, a, a statement that the Torah says, that the Talmud says, that God desires heart. God wants heart. God wants effort. God wants sincere effort. Even if it's a little bit, even if it's not the greatest, the most flashy, you know, the most unbelievable of, of sponsorships, but if it's something that was worked upon, it was something that was given with great effort, then God, then God values that. The Torah values such effort. The Torah values such working and trying and working hard. Things that are heaven sent, things that are done that come easy, easy come, easy go, as the world says. Um, the, there was a story said about the Chavetz Chaim. The Chavetz Chaim that many of us have heard of, who lived about a hundred years ago. The Chavetz Chaim was a great scholar, prolific author. The Chavetz Chaim had a yeshiva in his small town of Radin. And there was once a, a fellow, a wealthy fellow, who approached him and offered to undertake and underwrite the entire budget for the Radin yeshiva, whether it was for that year or for long, longer term, I don't, I, don't, I don't recall. But it was a tremendous, tremendous amount of money that he offered. And um, maybe uh, it'll come as a surprise to some, and, and uh, don't tell this to the, uh, the fundraisers for this coming, uh, this coming week's uh, Yeshiva Tana dinner, but the Chavetz Chaim refused. He said, no, I'm not taking it. Why? He said, he said the, the merit for, the, for the, <coughs> the, the merit for the giving and for the, the budget and for the campaign that's the yearly budget of the Rad and Yeshiva, is not one man's merit. It's not one man's chus. That merit belongs to the small donations, the small the people who work hard for their paycheck, the people who are literally sacrificing, whose $18 check is, is literally cutting into their monthly budget. Those are the people whose merit the Yeshiva, the yeshiva and Radin stands on. And to give it to one person is taking away from them, it's taking away from me, it's taking away from the students, the students who toil day and night, day and night in the Holy Torah. So this merit I want to be spread out to those self-sacrificing individuals. So to apply this to us, I think it's very, very obvious, um, something that's been spoken about many times here on Tuesday nights, is that God doesn't want and God doesn't need our presence, God doesn't need things from us, but what God does ask of us is that we should give heart even in small amounts, whether it's coming out for an hour on Tuesday night, which in God's eyes is a big thing. It's a major thing, especially when it's the, you know, the dead of winter and the cold, coldest month of the year. God values that, God treasures that, and God is proud of us. Thank you for listening.